Is global nuclear arms control in danger? President Vladimir Putin has suspended Russia's participation in the New START treaty, the last remaining arms control agreement. Now, for the first time in half a century, U.S. and Russian nuclear warheads will go unchecked, sparking fears of a nuclear arms race. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the new START treaty. Well, nuclear rhetoric appears to be ramping up. Russia's former prime minister and an ally of President Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Medvedev, said today that the West's continued arms supply to Ukraine risks a global nuclear catastrophe. His comments come off the back of Putin's suspension of the New START treaty last week, a nuclear arms control pact between the U.S. and Russia. Now, Putin claims the war in Ukraine is an existential battle for the survival of Russia and the Russian people, saying he has to take NATO's nuclear capabilities into account. NATO and the West reject that, saying their objective is to help Ukraine defend itself against an unprovoked attack. The pact suspension is unlikely to have an immediate effect, but Russia and the U.S. together hold more than 90 percent of the world's nuclear weapons. So left unchecked, there are fears not only of an arms race between Russia and the United States, but also among other nuclear powers, including China. Let's get a closer look now at the new START treaty. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. As U.S. President Joe Biden was visiting Kyiv and Warsaw on the first anniversary of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, Russian President Vladimir Putin declared his country was suspending its participation in the New START treaty. There were warning signs earlier on. In February, only days after the conflict began, Putin issued a state of high alert, ordering nuclear forces to go to what he called special mode of combat duty. As of now, New START is the only remaining nuclear arms control pact between the United States and Russia. First signed in 2010, the deal means both countries can only deploy 1,500 strategic nuclear warheads, 700 long-range missiles and bombers, 800 international ballistic missiles, and no more. Each year, the sites can carry out 18 inspections at strategic nuclear weapon sites to check if there are any pact violations. These inspections were put on hold in March 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic and a November 2022 meeting to plan resuming investigations was postponed by Russia. And now the Kremlin accuses NATO of openly seeking to attack Russian nuclear facilities, hence the suspension of New START. And some believe this decision poses a danger to the future of nuclear arm control. It's important to acknowledge New START has been a really successful treaty. As of January, uh, the two countries had conducted 328 inspections since 2010. This is a really big achievement. And so losing that transparency into the Russian arsenal, losing that predictability, it's going to be a lot harder to understand if and how Putin is expanding the arsenal. And that might result in the rise of uncontrolled nuclear arming in other countries. I think quite possibly China's leaders see uh, Putin suspending the New START agreement um, as a way, as a window of opportunity to accelerate even further um, its, its nuclear capabilities. So China may be emboldened by that. Even though Putin stressed he was only suspending, 
and not terminating Russia's involvement in the treaty, some analysts believe otherwise. They say this may just be the end of bilateral dialogue between Washington and Moscow. So just how serious are the implications of Russia's suspension of the New START treaty? Well, joining me now to debate that are from Washington, D.C., David Jonas, former general counsel of the National Nuclear Security Administration and professor of law at George Washington University. From Moscow, Sergei Markov, director of the Institute of Political Studies and former member of the Russian parliament. And from Washington, John Arith, senior policy director for the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation. Thanks all so much for being with us. Uh, David Jonas, I'll start with you. You uh, seem to think in a sense that this is, I don't know, much ado about nothing because Russia, you've said, wasn't even following the treaty in the first place. So any move in any direction is just, I don't know, symbolic at best? Well, I believe that they generally don't comply with their treaty obligations. And I think that's why President Trump withdrew from, from several treaties, arms control treaties. I also think that this is a way to sort of poke a stick in President Biden's eye. I believe that they fully understand how important arms control is to him. And they, they're well aware that he extended START by five, for five years with asking nothing in return, which is a fairly remarkable way to do business in terms of treaty negotiations. And by doing this, this shows that they certainly don't place anywhere near the value on it that, that we do. However, uh, you know, that said, they did not withdraw from the treaty. They simply suspended mm -hmm. their, their participation in it. Right. And that suspension equates to inspections. Uh, what's really at risk if these inspections are not carried out? Well, the question is, from, from a legal perspective, is what, what does it really mean? I mean, if, what, what's the legal authority for, for, their, for them to do this? There's nothing in the treaty that allows suspension. There's the treat, arms control tip, treaties typically have a provision that allow withdrawal, but they haven't gone so far as to withdraw. So what does it really mean? I mean, they're, not, they're, they're refusing to admit inspectors, but they've been refusing to admit inspectors. Mm. I think it's a, a signal that they're sending us. I don't think that they're about to uh, exceed the limits of the treaty in terms of missiles, launchers, weapons. I don't think that's happening here. Okay, John, what does it mean? I think what it means clearly is that there's a message being sent from Russia. Uh, this is uh, uh, very closely timed to the first year of the war. And uh, the message is clearly that uh, Russia wants to uh, increase this, the uh, perception of nuclear danger. The idea that if things go badly in the war, that it could go badly for the whole world. Uh, so it is another nuclear threat that is coming out of Moscow. Uh, as uh, David says, the, the Russian side has not been implementing the treaty for some time. So there is little practical effect, but it's a symbolic one. Mm. Uh, we have less in arms control now, the idea that uh, the, the level of danger is higher than it's ever been before is, uh, is very prominent. And I think we see that uh, the, this is part of a concerted Russian strategy uh, to put increased pressure on Ukraine and Ukraine supporters to seek a negotiated end to the war that would leave Russian gains intact. Okay. Sergey, is this just a message, you know, some sort of symbolism here, or is there a lot more dangerous substance to what Putin has decided to do in suspending this treaty? Both. Um, uh, first of all, it's a signal to the NATO countries, which uh, now uh, want to uh, uh, have plan to have a military victory over the uh, uh, Russian army on the territory which they believe uh, it's Ukraine, but we believe it's uh, uh, Russian territory. And uh, so this uh, absolutely uh, clear that uh, Washington, which is a real actor, because <laughs> all other members of NATO after uh, intensive discussion every time I agree with uh, Washington and the Ukrainian government from our point of view just does not exist as an independent government and uh, a fully puppet uh, regime controlled by Washington. So Washington don't want uh, to have any negotiation. Washington decided to give more and more weaponry to their proxy army, which is Ukrainian army. 
and uh, to have a military victory. To them, Vladimir Putin saying, look, forget about this. Uh, Russia is nuclear superpower. Uh, we will never uh, have a military failure. It's behind this, it means that, remember, that we can use nuclear weaponry. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, today, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the former Russian president, also published the article uh, uh, in a uh, Russian newspaper, and he even more clearly say, uh, if uh, the world without Russia, uh, we doesn't need it. It right. shouldn't exist, the world without Russia. So it means that Russia will be ready uh, to use nuclear uh, weaponry uh, if the uh, uh, West will uh, continue the attacking uh, against Russia. It's a uh, main signal. Another thing... But how, I guess, Sergei, uh, just uh, before you go on, I mean, you, you, I'm, I'm trying to understand. You've said very clearly that Russia never left the framework as it's being portrayed. But you've also said to be a superpower, you need to be able to use nuclear weapons. And Russia does have this possibility and Russia will use it before every defeat. So in one point, you sound like Russia is adhering to its international obligations under the treaty it signed, but then you make this threat saying, push us and we will use it because we will not lose. Uh, Russia, you know, what's it? Vladimir Putin and me never told that Russia will never, uh, will be out of the framework of this treaty. Now we will be in this framework of this treaty. But if Russia need it, Russia will leave this treaty. In few directions. One, it's directly using of nuclear weaponry. If we decided that we have a, a real threat to the existence of Russia, and I should also, also Vladimir Putin, a few days ago, he told that plan of Washington, who is aggressor from our point of view, uh, the plan of Washington, just division of Russian Federation and division of Russian people. It will be no Russians. It will okay. be Muscovite, Siberians, and so on. It's one direction of uh, Russian way out of the treaty. Another direction, another direction, is also very important. Russia can make uh, its nuclear potential bigger and more cheap by changing of uh, 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 unify uh, nuclear warheads by so-called uh, 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 fissiles uh, okay. uh, nuclear uh, heads, which is, it means that on the one rocket it could be. Uh, 10 or 15 uh, nuclear bombs, uh, and it can go to the direction of the uh, NATO countries. Okay. And uh, uh, means that uh, no, uh, no, uh, no ro- anti-rocket missile system mm. uh, can uh, stop Russian um, uh, nuclear attack. David, I, I mean, I have to ask this question then. As for the pact itself... When you hear the position of Russia saying, oh, yes, we'll sign on and we'll honor our obligations, but if we're going to lose, we'll employ whatever means necessary, including nuclear weapons that are at our disposal, in order to win, because we're the victim of an aggressor. So, uh, David, why is so much time and energy even invested in such pacts when that will be the stance of its, of its major players, or at least one of them? That's a great question, Andrea. Part of the problem is, and we see it repeatedly, is that the Western countries tend to observe their, their obligations, even if they're non, non-legally non binding, whereas countries like Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, simply sign on to anything they feel like, and then they don't observe it. So it's a problem. Now, the, this threat, this business of threatening nuclear weapons is an entirely new thing. Remember, we've got a 70-year, eight-year fire break between the last use of nuclear weapons and anger. And for a nuclear weapon state under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and a state that sits on the UN Security Council to be threatening the use of nuclear weapons puts the entire nuclear non-proliferation regime at risk and is a very, very bad thing. Even if they're talking about just using a small tactical nuclear weapon, they're, they're th- the threat sends quite a message. And it's, it's rather remarkable that Russia is doing this and it's entirely unacceptable. You know, John, this treaty was supposed to be used uh, for means of protection, protecting the global population and all its citizens against uh, the use of nuclear weapons and not to be used as leverage to threaten uh, one side or another. So, I mean, how does it come to this? How has it come to this? And what message does it send other countries, not least China, 
who might just say, you know what? We need to worry about our own defense. We need to build up whatever arsenal we feel is necessary uh, to make sure, be it nuclear or not, uh, in order to continue the protection of our own interests. Andrea, you've made a very good point and raised a, a very important question. Uh, the, the Russian Federation is currently using the threats of nuclear weapons as an instrument of statecraft uh, to get what it regards as a favorable outcome for this war. Uh, that is a very dangerous precedent because should that happen and should the nuclear threats be perceived as being effective in securing uh, a greater share of Ukrainian territory for Russia, uh, then other countries are going to pay attention. Uh, China, you mentioned North Korea, for example, uh, will be then able to see, oh, nuclear threats work. Maybe this is what we should do the next time we have a problem with one of our neighbors. So there may not be a use of nuclear weapons in this particular conflict, but the likelihood that they may be used in the future increases greatly over time. And that is even worse when you have a situation where arms control is not perceived as working. I mean, Sergei, did, did Russia ever sign this agreement in good faith? Oh, yeah. Uh, this treaty has been signed because it's important treaty, and Russia very much insisted uh, that, uh, this should, uh, that uh, this treaty should work. And we still believe that uh, this treaty uh, should uh, uh, work. Uh, Russia don't want to use uh, a nuclear weapon. Russia don't threaten, by the way, I will answer to my colleague, uh, uh, Russia did not uh, threaten by um, uh, using uh, nuclear weapons. Russia just saying people, forget about your plan to have military victory about Russia, because if it will be a real threat, probably in the future, Russia will uh, have uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, threatened uh, by uh, doing this in future, possibly it will be uh, in the uh, difficult situation. But you say it's un, um, uh, unacceptable, but I would say what is unacceptable? Unacceptable that United States overthrowing uh, by force the elected president of Ukraine and imposed fascist junta to Ukrainian people, which conducted the policy of governmental terrorism against people. And this is, you know, probably they uh, they Russians, first of all, and this prohibited for them to use Russian language in the education system and everywhere and so on. It's aggression against the Russian people. And we okay. have to give response. This is unacceptable to have aggression in the, okay. among, against one of the um, leading nations of the uh, uh, modern history. And again, Sergei, because you feel it is aggression, Russia can and use whatever means necessary to ensure its own security. Yes. So, David, let me just finalize with one last question on the pact itself that mm -hmm. I, I led to with John. I mean, when we look at these treaties, we have to ask, you know, if everyone is not going to be on board, if you have Russia, North Korea, China, potentially Iran developing weapons as we speak, I mean, does it render all of these agreements basically, basically useless? Well, the, the main concern is that the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which is the, the cornerstone of the nuclear nonproliferation regime and the most successful arms control treaty in history with about 190 states party to it, that it may fall apart if we see use of a nuclear weapon or additional states obtain nuclear weapons. Let me just clarify one thing, though. START and Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the Test Ban Treaty, Nuclear Weapon Free Zones, all these treaties none prohibit the use of nuclear weapons. So, you know, there, there are a variety of, of legal opinions out there on whether the use of nuclear weapons is, is lawful, mm -hmm. but it's, it's very interesting to hear uh, our, our Russian friend cat categorizing Western aggression when it's Russia who invaded. So that's, that's kind of a turning the, the entire thing on its head, but, I'll leave it at that. Okay, David Jonas, Sergei Markov, and John Arith. I'd like to thank all three of you so much for being with us on this uh, segment of the Newsmakers. Greatly appreciate it. Well, let's get another perspective now on whether we should fear the consequences of the START Treaty's apparent unraveling. And joining me 
From Cambridge is Paul Ingram, Senior Research Associate at Cambridge University's Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Paul, thanks so much uh, for being with us. I know you just heard uh, our previous conversation, and I, I need you to help us understand what you think the real implications are on the global population here. I mean, was the START Treaty farcical to begin with, as some have argued, or um, does its apparent unraveling now actually mark a real risk to the world? Okay, so first and foremost, this is a problem because uh, not, not least we are in the middle of a conflict in which nuclear warnings are being used. And if one side is saying, we no longer want to participate in these nuclear arms control agreements, that sends a symbolic message that they are willing to do things that previously they were feeling bound by. Mm. That's the first point. It doesn't dramatically and directly change the risk of nuclear war, but it does show a, a, a symbolic problem. Second point, this arms control treaty is absolutely key to the relationship between the United States and Russia. And if this treaty starts unraveling, it is the very last of a, of a very complex network of treaties that have been uh, deteriorating ever since 2001, uh, when the United States withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. The historical record demonstrates that it's the Americans rather than the Russians that have largely been pulling away from these uh, from these treaties. And I think that demonstrates that the Americans, for whatever reason, probably because they feel uh, quite um, superior in the in the in their capabilities, uh, see these treaties as uh, as uh, in the past. And that's a okay. real problem. Yeah, I mean, you seem very worried about global governance actually isolating Russia rather than engaging Russia. I mean, why is isolation, do you think, so irresponsible uh, in this well, case? Because some would argue the, um, the only other option really is kind of to appease Putin. Yeah, so um, there's no uh, equivalence to uh, dealing with uh, uh, countries that you may not like uh, in managing the existential risks that our globe faces. We need to manage nuclear weapons, we need to manage biological weapons, we need to manage climate, uh, uh, the climate crisis uh, and uh, global, um, global challenges. And uh, we've got plenty of arenas to, uh, to uh, censure the Russians for their actions in Ukraine. Uh, we've got the Security Council, we've got the General Assembly, we've got a number of different places. The trouble comes when Western governments choose to attempt to isolate Russia in these, in these arenas that need to be protected, be it nuclear weapons or other arenas. It, 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 it shouldn't be the case that the Ukraine war means that we don't have agreements on tackling the climate crisis because that affects all of us. And if we allow these, these um, disagreements and conflicts to get in the way of global governance, then we all suffer and we all could mm. suffer incredibly badly. Uh, and and uh, so we need firewalls. And this is something that we have managed in the past during the Cold War. Right. We had arms control agreements made at the height of the Cold War. We need to learn, relearn that lesson. But the ultimate deterrent in any of these agreements, the savior at the end of the day, is the fact that uh, there is the law of mutual destruction. As in, if Russia deploys nuclear weapons, the West will retaliate against Russia. I mean, is that really the only workable deterrent here? Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, if it is the only way in which we can relate to Russia, then we are in a really bad situation. Mm. But this is why I'm saying that we need to, to go beyond just simply relying on the threat of uh, nuclear war in order to contain the Russians. Uh, and and in order to manage these relationships governing nuclear weapons and other mechanisms there are there there is the rule of law there are day-to-day -day sanctions there are all sorts of instruments we could be using to uh, come to agreements with other countries that see the world very differently uh, recognize that uh, we we can't force people uh, to see the world and experience the world exactly the way we do uh, we we have different ways of managing this but we have to come together at the global level to manage these threats far more effectively than we have been doing and that we are getting worse at because mm -hmm. of this war 
and the way in which states have chosen to prioritize confrontation over cooperation with states that they don't agree with. So quickly, what are the chances of avoiding the worst? Ah, uh, so, so difficult. I am attempting not to lose sleep. I think we are, we are still some way away from a really serious problem here. Okay. But uh, my worry is that we are gradually sliding into a very, okay. very dangerous situation. Paul Ingram, we're going to have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we're over time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like thank to thank you so much for joining us, our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.